This video is brought to you by mybookie.ag. What's up, guys? We are here for one of the biggest cards, UFC 299, with a load of good fights, a load of good talent, some good prospects, especially that monster heavyweight in the early prelims. This card is looking insane. So many fighters on this is just gonna make it seem so surreal, like Michael Page finally in the UFC. I've been waiting for this for years, man. I've been talking about this guy since his second professional fight, and it's wild to finally see him in the UFC against a great opponent, Kevin Holland. Dustin Poirier's on the card, probably the biggest star. The only championship fight is the main event with Sean O'Malley versus Chito Vera 2. Gilbert Burns versus Jack Della is gonna be a great fight. Can't wait to see how that goes down. Peter Yan versus Song Yudong. Low key could be the best fight on the card. And if you notice something, there's a lot of young versus old in this. Dustin is 35 against the 28-year-old Benoit Saint-Denis. Gilbert Burns is 37 versus Jack Della, 27. Peter Yan is 31 versus Song Yudong, 26. Yan is not old, but there is a considerable age gap. Caitlin Chukagian, 35 versus the 25-year-old Macy Barber. Matus Gamras, 33. RDA is 39. It's more so that RDA is way too old at this point to be a lightweight. Pedro Munoz, 37 versus the 28-year-old Kyler Phillips. Ian Kutilaba, 30, versus the 38-year-old Felipe Linz. You would think Rebellas de Spain was the young guy, but he's actually older than Josh Parisian. Poor guy. And Joanne Wood is 38, versus the 32-year-old Marina Moroz. Again, more so that Joanne Wood is too old at this point. And if you guys want to know my last picks, I got 13 out of 17 correct overall in the last two cards. Got 5 out of 5 in the last card, and then... 8 out of 12 in the card before, which is a pretty good pick rate, but the breakdowns are ultimately what matters, and I have to say that the prospect of the night easily goes to that Cuban experiment, Rebellas de Spain, the 6 foot 7, 258 pound Olympic bronze medalist in Taekwondo with an 87 inch reach, they say he's 35, but he's probably actually 20, Rebellas de Spain is a monster. I feel so bad for Josh Parisian, man, because he really doesn't have a choice. He's got to take this guy on, and if he loses, that could be it for him in the UFC. Imagine a way to go out is going up against this guy. Rebellas de Spain is going to do some very scary things to these heavyweights. Does he have takedown defense? We don't know, because he just punches you and he knocks you out. But when it comes to the stand-up, there's going to be very few amount of fighters that are going to be able to handle him. And it's crazy to say a 35-year-old is a prospect, but, but you know about these Cubans, they're physically way younger than their age tells you. The fighter of the night, in my opinion, is Dustin Poirier. He's the biggest star of the show. He's putting himself a bit of risk to go up against such a lower-ranked opponent, but that's the kind of guy Dustin is. That's why we love him, man. He's willing to step up against this young, hungry up-and-comer who's seen the realness of wars and battles. Benoit saint Denis is going to come after Dustin with everything he's got from beginning to end, and that's going to be a very dangerous fight for Dustin Poirier. The stake of the night, the fighter that has in hot waters is Josh Parisian. He needs to win this fight. If he loses, that might be it for him in the UFC. He has two losses in a row. He's two and four in his last six fights. He needs to make something happen here. And some people might say Peter Jan, but I don't think so as much. I mean, three losses in a row is pretty bad, but two of those were very, very close. And I think he beat Sean O'Malley. The only guy that really beat him like that was Marab, and that's it. The other two losses were very close. The banger of the night, the most explosive fun fight on the card, is easily that co-main event. Dustin Poirier versus Benoit Saint-Denis. There's no way this fight is boring. These two guys are gonna go through a war. Both these guys thrive in those kind of environments. Benoit's gonna come after him with raw power, just pure ferocity, and Dustin's gonna have to try to stop this guy with clean and powerful technique. And the fight of the night, the best overall fight on the card, I think it's Peter Yan versus Song Yudong. This fight is closely contested. I think either guy can win this. Both guys are technical, they're composed. And because of Song Yudong's style, it's going to mesh well with Peter Yan because both guys are willing to wait for their openings and every single exchange is going to be super explosive. We're going to start seeing some of those Peter Yan combinations, man, like he threw against Corey Sandhagen and Song Yudong is going to try to explode, blasting him with the right hand and low kicks. That's going to be really fun, but let's start in the beginning with Joanne Wood versus Marina Moroz. I have to go with Moroz. Joanne Wood is just way too old. Even though she's coming off that win against Luana Carolina, I think her submission defense is not going to be up to par against Moroz, and I just don't see her catching up with her overall in these exchanges. They're going to CJ Vergara versus Asu Amabayev. This is going to be an easy one for Amabayev. Definitely a lock on the card. These Kazakhs are entering the UFC out of nowhere. He has powerful strikes, not the most technical with just touching and finding openings and stuff like that. He likes to throw one setup and then throw out the overhand or throw out the right high kick and then shoot for the single leg. He's more of a grappler than anything else. He has a low single leg to create contact and chain wrestles from there. Very good at getting your back. Vergar doesn't have the best wrestling or grappling overall. This is definitely shown when he fought Tatsuro Tyra and he's a bit slower than Amabayev as well. Not good enough of a boxer to even have a clean win in the stand-up either. So I'm going to go with Amabayev. 
by a submission. Then we go to Rebellus Despain versus Josh Parisian. They gotta get the paramedics ready before this fight starts. Good lord, Parisian is gonna get obliterated. I hope he doesn't get hurt too badly. And I'm not saying that like as a joke, I'm being for real. So definitely have to go with Rebellus Despain. I'm going by a first round knockout, maybe a minute into the fight. So Despain is another lock for me. Then we go to Michelle Pereira versus Mikel Alexiochuk. This is a pretty interesting fight. So Michelle Pereira in the middleweight division again. He has been cleaning up his technique and trying to stick behind the jab and the front kick and not do anything too crazy. And especially against Mikel, if you get wild, he's going to counter you because he does have considerable power. Michelle Pereira as a middleweight is a pretty big guy. It's crazy to think he ever even made the welterweight division because even for this weight class, he's pretty big. He's got the athleticism. He has the explosive power out of nowhere. You saw this when he fought Petrovsky. Definitely looks a lot more powerful as a middleweight than he did as a welterweight he doesn't have to cut so much anymore so he's able to hold that maximum power but Mikel's a pretty good southpaw left hand and he's decent at cutting the opponent off we know Michelle Pereira is going to be moving around a lot and Mikel's going to try to cut him off to line him up for the left hand it might shoot some takedowns to offset and pummel Pereira with that ground and pound but the thing that I can see Michelle Pereira doing here is disrupting Mikel's movements whenever he's looking to cut off on the outside this is even shown in the chitty fight with Mikel it's quite easy to get him off balance if you just intercept some of the movements and that leads this fight to be very tricky to predict because either guy can win this definitely a fight not to bet on in my opinion I think his athleticism is really going to help him here whereas Mikel is not nearly as athletic as he is not nearly as fast which can make it trickier for Mikel to cut him off and because of that it's going to make it easier for Michelle Pereira to intercept him so I'm going with Pereira by a second round TKO then Ian Kutilaba versus Felipe Linz. Felipe Linz low-key has gotten pretty good compared to what he was at heavyweight. And I'm probably going to go with him. He's going to be bigger than Ian Kutilaba. Kutilaba's chin is absolutely shot. And because of Linz's strength and size, it might be hard for Kutilaba to get him to the ground. He has to find Linz's chin as Linz is pressuring forward. But if he can't do that, I see Linz just putting out too much pressure and eventually crumbling in Kutilaba under that volume for a TKO. So I'm going to go with the underdog here. Then we go to Pedro Munoz versus Kyler Phillips. I'm going to go with Kyler Phillips. He is so underrated, man. And Pedro Munoz is old. But the only guys that Pedro Munoz has lost to are the best fighters at bantamweight. Right, he lost a Cheeto, Dominic Cruz, Jose Aldo, Frankie Edgar, Aljamain Sterling back in the day with John Dodson, Jimmy Rivera, and then before that, Rafael Asuncao. But I think it's Kyler Phillips' time. He's way faster. His length is going to give him an advantage. He has a good transition from boxing to wrestling. He's going to have some good low kicks, but against Pedro Munoz's light kicks, he might look to take the fight to the ground, even though that could be very risky considering Pedro Munoz's guillotine. I could see him at times going that direction and defending the guillotine. But for the most part, I just see him beating Pedro at range. So I think Kyler Phillips is going to win this by a decision. Considering the odds on this, it's not a fight I would bet on. Kyler Phillips is a pretty big favorite, much bigger than I would give him. And then finally, we're going to go to Caitlin Chukagian. Well, officially her name is Caitlin Sermonara, but she's just so much older, man. She's 10 years older at 35 years old. I'm still going to go with her, though. I'm still going to go with her. I think Macy Barber will have a bright future, but I think the movement of Caitlin Chukagian is going to give her a big issue. Caitlin's going to try to stall out the fight as much as possible, and perhaps Macy Barber can win this off of damage to a decision or something, which is why it's another fight I would not really bet on. Macy Barber does not have good distance management. She backed up a lot against Rebos, and Rebos is able to touch her up a lot. I think Caitlin Chukagian, because of her movement and length, is going to make it a lot more difficult for Barber to get at her. The jabs, the straight, some side kicks just to push away Barber and keep constant activity to win points is a way I could see Caitlin Chukagian winning this fight. Mixing in some takedowns here and there, maybe, but the only thing is Barber hits so hard. So I'm going to go with the underdog here, Caitlin Chukagian, by a decision. So there's some really good picks here, some really good odds. Definitely some of these fights are locks before we get into the featured fights. Make sure to go to mybookie.ag to capitalize on your picks. The main event is changing a little bit. Sean O'Malley is a minus 290 against the plus 195 Marlon Vera. Very big favor for O'Malley. It's personally a fight I wouldn't bet on. And the only way I would bet on it is to put something on Cheeto if you're confident that he's going to pull off the big upset because he is a big underdog. But I would personally avoid that fight. Dustin Poirier is actually an underdog against Benoit St. Denis and a considerable one. Benoit is minus 210. Dustin is a plus 155. Dustin is my dog of the card. Crazy is an underdog, man. Kevin Holland is a slight favorite against Michael Page. This is another fight I would probably avoid. Anything could happen in this fight. Either guy can knock each other out. Kevin Holland definitely has the better chin, but Michael Page is a lot trickier to defend against. He can catch Kevin Holland with a punch he doesn't see coming, more so than the other way around. Gilbert Burns is an underdog against Jack Della Maddalena. This is a tricky fight to pick, in my opinion, because Gilbert Burns could get the fight to the ground, but Jack Della could beat him in the stand-up. If Burns gets him to the ground, he should win the fight. Jack Della so far has had really good takedown defense. If he shows that in this fight, he should win this. 
So I'll get into that more when we talk about it. Peter Yan and Song Gedong is a pick em. Minus 115 going both ways. Very tough fight to pick. Probably another fight I would avoid. Curtis Blades versus Jelson Almeida is another close pick em fight. I'm liking Curtis Blades, man. I'm really liking Curtis Blades. Just generally on paper. Good takedown defense. Better striking than Jelton. Just a simple heavyweight stylistic matchup. Caitlin Chukagin is an underdog against Macy Barber. Plus 160 against a minus 220. Matus Gamera is a huge favorite against RDA. Minus 450. In fact, he's the second biggest favorite on the entire card. And for good reason as well. RDA is just so old. I would say Matus Gamera is a lock. But even at RDA's age, he's not bad. Matus Gamera is a fighter to look closely to. Pedro Munoz is an underdog against Kyler Phillips. I do agree with this, but not as wide as they made it. I think Kyler Phillips could lose the fight. Depends on what he does, but I do ultimately pick him to win. I don't think it's a good fight to bet on. Michelle Perez, a slight favorite against Mikel Alexiachuk. Another fight I wouldn't really bet on. Ian Kutilaba, a slight favorite against Felipe Linz. I do like Linz as an underdog. Rebellas de Spain against Josh Parisian is a lock in my opinion. Asu Amabayev is a lock against Carlos Vergara. Marina Moroz and Joanne Wood. I wouldn't say it's a lock, but it's like a, another Matush Gamera situation. There's other ways you guys can bet on this as well. Parlays the group of fighters you are confident in winning to multiply your earnings. Or you can go by props and wagers. Like who's going to win by knockout, who's going to win by submission, decision, all that stuff. And there's even live betting to test your analytical ability. You can go through all of this at mybookie.ag where they're going to give you a deposit bonus for your first deposit. They'll match up whatever you put in all the way up to $1,000. So if you put in $1,000, they will give you another $1,000 to play with. And all you have to do is use the promo code WEASEL in order to activate that offer. That's promo code W-E-A-S-L-E. -E. To take advantage of my bookie sign up offer, remember to visit mybookie.ag today where you can win big. Let's get right into our first featured fight Matush Gamrot versus Hafa dos Anjos. RDA is so old, man. 39. He's definitely declined. Matush Gamrot's coming off two wins in a row. He is three and two in his last five fights, but that spans four years. He completely missed out on 2021. He was active in 2022, but only had one fight in 2023, and has been changing weight classes, which is something I never like for fighters. It's been displayed throughout combat sports. When you keep moving it up and down weight classes, it usually hurts you. And the older you get, the harder those weight cuts at 155 are going to be. And Matush Gamera is only getting better. RDA usually has decent takedown defense at 155, but I think it's definitely going to get tested against Matush. And I think RDA is going to get taken to the ground at some points of the fight. And Gamera's going to have the speed advantage with his footwork. He's going to be landing some good right straight, some good body kicks. He's going to have to watch out for RDA's body and head kicks though. But I ultimately do think that Matush Gamera is going to win this fight through a decision. Ultimately just racking up on the points, landing more shots, getting RDA to the ground. But I don't see him finishing RDA at all. It's going to be really hard to submit someone like RDA. He's very good on the ground. And Gamera hasn't really shown that kind of power and precision throughout his career to knock opponents out at this level. And then we go to the heavyweights. Curtis Blades versus Jelton Almeida. The wrestler versus grappler matchup. And because Curtis Blades is the wrestler of the two, a definite size advantage over Jelton Almeida, he could stuff all the takedowns from Jelton and just beat him in the stand-up, right? Because what we see from Jelton Almeida in the stand-up is he's not too confident there, man. He's athletic and fast and he moves his feet, but he just doesn't have the striking prowess, at least as of what we've seen so far. Maybe out of nowhere, he shows us something a little bit different than a front kick. I think the fundamentals of Curtis Blades, with the jab and the right cross specifically, are going to pay dividends. Sprawl and brawl Jelton Almeida is the clear game plan for Curtis Blades to win this fight and I think he's going to do it. Stylistically on paper, this is one of the toughest fights for Jalton Almeida, but if he gets Curtis Blades to the ground some way, whether he pulls guard, which would be interesting, or he double legs Curtis Blades, Jelton probably should win the fight then. But it just seems so unlikely with who Jelton has been fighting. He took down Derek Lewis, Jarzina Rosenstrike, Anton Tarkali, Parker Porter, and old Shamil. Like, these guys don't have wrestling like Curtis Blades at all. So my prediction for this, I'm ultimately going to go with Curtis Blades. And I think he's going to win this through a decision. I think Jelton Almeida is going to do as much as he can to avoid the striking. He's going to shoot many times on Blades. And I do see Blades stuffing them. And just ultimately winning this fight through a jab, right cross, and an uppercut. And then we go to the main card. Peter Yan versus Song Yadong. Probably the best fight on the whole card. So Peter Yan's been kind of inactive. He hasn't fought since he lost to Marab Davalashvili back in March of 2023. It's been a whole year and I can only imagine he's been honing his craft and filling out the gaps in his game before he takes up another high level fight. Song Gedong, on the other hand has fought two times in 2023 and last fought in December a few months ago. He's been looking pretty good man especially TKO and Ricky Simone. He completely outclassed Chris Gutierrez. I don't even know what Gutierrez was doing in that fight. 
we definitely know that Peter Yan is not going to roll for Iminaris. This fight's most likely going to contest in the stand-up unless Song Gedong tries to take him to the ground, right? Try to implement something Marab Davalos really did. A lot of volume, mix up the boxing with the wrestling, land a lot of light kicks on Peter Yan's more boxing-oriented style, especially where he likes to cover up, right? So Song Gedong can faint up top with the jab and then land a low kick as Peter Yan covers. But he has to be careful because Peter Yan will catch any potential overhand or hook that Song Gedong is going to throw as he's shelling up and throw a counter hook himself. He did this very well against someone like Sean O'Malley, who fights at a much longer range than Song Gedong. If this was a five round fight, I would definitely go with Peter Yan, but because it's three rounds, it could really go either way. It's not going to give Yan as much time to read, and I ultimately do think that first round is probably going to go to Song Gedong regardless. Just off the leg kicks and some of the right straights he's going to land, maybe one takedown in there. But as soon as the second round comes, Peter Yan is going to have some of those openings already set. I think he's going to land some good shots to the body, good check hooks as Song is reaching in for the power punches, and I think his takedown defense is going to get better as the fight goes on. But ultimately, my prediction for this fight, I'm going to go with Song Gedong. I think the three rounds favor him. He has more power. His leg kicks could be a bit of an issue, especially if he's throwing up good feints up high. And with those good feints also comes good double legs to get Yan to the ground just to rack up on points, land some good ground and pound, control the fight a bit. And ultimately, just the blueprint is out there, right? The blueprint is out there on how to beat Peter Yan. And I think Song Gedong has a good corner behind him. He's an intelligent fighter. He's won fights with striking. He's won fights with wrestling. Like, he knows exactly what he needs to do in order to mix this up against Peter Yan. He has to have a lot of both skill sets here. And unless Peter Yan has made some drastic changes in his style, I think Song Gedong is going to win this by a decision. And then we go to Gilbert Burns versus Jack Della Maddalena, the old versus the young. Gilbert Burns has been around for a long time. He's coming off shoulder surgery at his age too. It's definitely not going to help him. He hasn't fought in 10 months, whereas Jack Della has been very active. He fought three times in 2023, last fought in September against Kevin Holland. Not his best performance. And even before that against Basil Hafiz, probably his worst performance he's ever had. I guess the fighter took it up on short notice, but Basil Hafiz got him to the ground. And that's a very scary thing for Jack Della going up against Gilbert Burns. That first round was dicey with the takedown defense. And even pulling guillotines? For sure, he's not going to pull any guillotines on Gilbert Burns. As long as he keeps his fight standing up, he should have an advantage here. He's a better boxer. He has a much better ability to read the opponent. He has some tricky intercepting kicks. A very good ability to cut off the cage. This was somewhat shown in the Randy Brown and Danny Roberts fights. He could fight in both stances pretty well too. So if he wants to take Southpaw against the orthodox Burns, he could line up the left straight off of hand trapping. Whereas Burns is just so basic, like simple with what he throws. An overhand, a right straight. He has a decent jab. He could catch it with a left hook around the guard. As he showed against Damian Mai, who was another Southpaw. So if Jack Della takes a Southpaw stance, he has to keep that right guard up high, which he does very well. But anytime he drops it, Burns is very fast to get in on you. A good right low kick and right body kick. This is going to definitely change up depending on the stance of Jack Della. But I think all of this stuff can be addressed by Jack. I mean, he dealt with the reach of Kevin Holland and Randy Brown. Randy Brown can be pretty tricky with what he throws too. Burns is not going to have a right hand that Jack Della hasn't seen before. I think Burns has to take the fight to the ground. And that is a bit iffy, you know. I don't know where Jack Della's take on defense is against a guy the caliber of Burns. But considering Burns is 37 years old and he's coming off shoulder surgery and hasn't fought in 10 months... I have to go Jack Della Malena, even though he can lose this fight. It's a fight I would definitely not bet on, because if Burns gets him to the ground, he probably will win this fight. But I'm ultimately going with Jack Della by a decision. And then we go to the snipers. Kevin Holland versus Michael Page. I cannot wait for this one, man. Whose right hand is going to win? Both guys are 6'3", and they have practically like an 80-inch reach. Kevin Holland plods, whereas Michael Page is moving all around that octagon. Switching from orthodox to southpaw, he has a much better right straight than he does a left, but he has very good kicks from both stances, man. And that could be a bit of a difference maker here, as Kevin Holland, he doesn't have a lot of variety. He has a decent jab and a good right straight. He will throw up an open stance kick sometimes, but everything else is very wild. Like, wild left hook, haymakers, uppercuts, just come out at wide angles. And that's going to be quite difficult to catch someone like Michael Page, who, in my opinion, is going to be the faster of the two. He has way better foot work overall but Kevin Holland could time the bounce right with all these guys who like the bounce you're starting to see him get timed a lot easier this is shown against Robert Whitaker when he fought Drickus Duplessy this was last show when Umar fought Baksa Amakan and perhaps Kevin Holland is precise enough and has good enough timing with that right hand to time Michael Page's blitz or whenever he's bouncing in and out and knocks him out because I think if Kevin Holland does land the right hand he will knock out Michael Page. 
And the thing is, Michael Page moves in straight lines. He's always moving forward and back constantly and looking to blitz you with crazy speed and reach. But the thing is, Kevin Holland also doesn't really have great defense. He will pick his hands up sometimes, so he's much better at bracing for impact. But where I really think Michael Page is going to have more success is off of his kicks and his jab, more than his power hand. I think he could keep a good in and out jab, open stance kicks on the body into the head, some good side kicks to the knee to keep Kevin Holland from entering on him. But if Michael Page takes the orthodox stance, I can see Kevin Holland throwing out the outside leg kick, kind of similar to what Douglas Lima did, in order to offset Michael Page so he can catch him with some big punch. But ultimately, my prediction for this fight, it could go either way, but I'm going to pick Michael Page in this one. I think he just has more variety. He's the faster fighter. I like the fact that he just moves around and can find openings on kicks off of long distances. And Michael Page is a lot more composed in order to drag the fight to a decision. So in a three rounder, I see MVP turning this into a point fight and mostly throwing power punches when Holland tries to get aggressive. We know Wonderboy found a ton of blitzing punches on Holland. MVP could do the same thing, but he throws those with different power and from a much further distance. So I'm going to go with Michael Page winning this fight by a decision. And then we go to the co-main event, Dustin Poirier versus Benoit Saint-Denis. The two Frenchmen. I think Dustin's French, right? Poirier is like the most French sounding name ever. This is an interesting one and I'm very shocked that they have Benoit as the favorite because technically speaking, Dustin's better than him in most areas of the game. The only two places I could see him having a problem is if Benoit is crowding him and just overpowering or he takes him to the ground and gets his back. Those are the two circumstances where I can see Benoit giving Dustin a lot of problems. But still even at that, Dustin's very good at finding counters when he's getting heavily pressured with power. This was shown even against Michael Chandler. Michael Chandler was throwing heat at this guy and Dustin still found that check hook even after he got headbutted. Dustin's takedown defense has gotten way better throughout his career. He has respectable Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu skills and if Benoit is not careful with a double leg, he can also fall into a guillotine himself. I think there's been this false narrative about Dustin Poirier that he's just not that good on the ground, which I don't even know where that comes from, except just looking at him losing Habib. But everybody loses the Habib like that, so it's not a good indicator. And the thing about Benoit is he's very wild at times, even on the ground. He will overcommit for submissions, like when he pulled that guillotine on Matt Frivola, for an example completely missed it even while they were both dry that was almost like 45 seconds into the fight but he did have a good reversal after but the thing is Matt Frivola is not Dustin Poirier at all so doing stuff like that to Dustin Poirier is gonna be way more difficult for Benoit but I do think Benoit could get the better of Dustin on the ground overall he's a big strong guy he has great jiu-jitsu he's generally hard to control but I think he creates so many openings for the opponent to get out that I think Dustin will take those and when it comes to the stand-up Benoit doesn't have much defense he kind of just backs up. That's all he really does. He'll keep his hands low at times. His head will be still while moving forward or even moving back. They're both southpaws, which is going to amplify Dustin Poirier's jab and check right hook. And that ultimately leads to my prediction for this. I'm going to go with Dustin Poirier winning this fight by a fourth round TKO. I don't think Benoit is going to be good going into the championship rounds. Dustin's going to have an advantage going there. He's so much better of a striker technically. He's dealt with power before. He's dealt with big guys before. Then we go to the main event. Sean O'Malley versus Chito Vera 2. The rematch is finally happening. One of the biggest fights for the bantamweight division that you can have, pay-per-view wise. And it's crazy that the first fight happened four years ago, man. So ever since the first fight where Chito knocked out Sean O'Malley, showed tremendous power in that ground and pound. But before that really didn't show too much on the feet outside of the leg kick. In fact, Chito didn't do anything really before the leg kick. O'Malley seemed to be the much better fighter and Chito just couldn't find his range, he couldn't find his openings. He landed one leg kick and then everything went downhill for Sean O'Malley from there. And even while on one leg, O'Malley was tagging him, which is crazy. I mean, the guy was really only able to balance well off of the front leg. He was throwing the right straight, which was partially landing on Chito and backing him up. And I can understand a lot of people were saying that, you know, if O'Malley never hurt his leg, that fight was going to be his all day. And because of that, O'Malley believes that it wasn't a real loss. And you know what they say, when you conceive something and you believe it, you will achieve it. And O'Malley is going to be that samurai for this fight. But aggressive Chito Vera could be the new mythical fighter. I've been saying it for a long time. If this guy just came forward with more output, he was more aggressive, he would be such a problem for the other strikers because his defense is the best. He has an iron chin behind the defense. So like, it's hard enough to hit this guy clean. And if you do, you can't even hurt him which is completely unfair for any striker going up against them. He also has pretty unorthodox technique with his hands, and he can find different angles, especially off that left hook, but he does have very good form of his kicks. Flexible, powerful, long legs, and if he does touch you, he has absurd power. I mean, I mean, the shots he was hitting Rob Font with were dazing him, and we know that Font doesn't have the best chin, but you could just see the power in Cheeto's punches. Not only that, when he fought Sean O'Malley, as soon as the fight went to the ground, 
Every single ground and pound shot was rocking or flashing O'Malley. If he touches O'Malley with a clean shot, O'Malley is going to get hurt. But it all depends on how Cheeto is going to get into the range. That seems to be the biggest problem for him. O'Malley moves so well and he's only gotten better with his footwork. Cheeto's cage cutting has gotten better, especially with how he threw the high kick at Dominic Cruz who was trying to move out. And Dominic Cruz has some of the best footwork, even though he is old now. And I wonder if Cheeto's going to bring back the takedowns. It's been a while, right? Cheeto has not gotten a takedown since 2021 when he fought Davy Grant. And his takedowns are not too bad. I mean, he could definitely mix those up to get in close on Sean O'Malley. So he could push up against the cage, dirty box, cut him off, and then land some big shots. And we saw the way that Peter Jan was able to get in on O'Malley with that big overhand that dropped him. You got to hand trap him so he stays in front of you. You're measuring distance, and then you pump something first because you know O'Malley always backs up. And then Cheeto can extend a right straight or an overhand from distance to catch O'Malley. But it's so against his style. He doesn't like to reach for punches. All of his punches are usually right in front of him, and it's going to be hard for him to catch O'Malley unless he pushes him against the cage and cuts him off. And that's why I ultimately do have to go with Sean O'Malley as my official prediction. I do like Cheeto a lot. I think if he is aggressive, he can win this fight. This is definitely a fight not to bet on, in my opinion, because a few adjustments from Cheeto could win him this fight. But he is a massive underdog, so maybe throwing something on him isn't too bad, but it's a fight I would ultimately stay away from to bet on. But I do think O'Malley is going to keep distance on him. I think he's going to land a lot of in and out jabs, but he's going to have to watch out for the counter leg kick from Cheeto. But the one two from O'Malley could throw off the outside leg kick from Cheeto. And I really just think jabs, one twos, front kicks, outside round leg kicks, and the occasional head kick are going to be the ways that O'Malley is going to win this. He has to move after every single strike he throws and really be mindful that the main thing that Cheeto's going to try to catch him with are the leg kicks as O'Malley exits and a potential hook here or there. So I'm ultimately going to go with Sean O'Malley and I think he's going to win this by a decision. I find it hard to see him knocking out Cheeto Vera. And in fact, if either guy gets finished, I, th I think it's more likely that Cheeto finishes O'Malley. And that's why I do have Cheeto having a much higher chance of winning than the odds are giving him. So I hope you guys enjoyed the predictions. And if you did, make sure to give this a like, make sure to subscribe at the bell for notifications, and I'll see you guys in the next video.